my friends. Today is that sweet day of accomplishment after you finish a large project or any project. So today morning I went to my studio, grabbed the Carl Mordor, I've put it on its honorable spot in my display case. Although it's not really honorable, it's just a spot because I'm kind of running out of space for new models. And I started cleaning up my studio. And, you know, as I was putting tools in their place, tidying up all those building materials for dioramas and putting those in my closet and everything. And I noticed that when I was getting rid of the Carlo Mordor box, including all the leftover sprues, um, I've put one sprue aside, and not only that, but also these metal shells that came with the kit. And it was because when I was searching for reference photos for that model, I came across two very interesting pictures, and I actually have them right here on my desktop. And yeah, they're basically unexploded shells that were found in Warsaw during the uprising in 1944. And, I mean, I came across a video showing that these 60 centimeter shells probably weren't the most reliable type of ammunition. I saved these pictures just in case, you know, because they're pretty interesting. And, well, as luck would have it, I also have one leftover figure from that project. And I mean, figures are kind of universal, right? So you can use them on some other model. But this actually seems to me like pretty good diorama, well, not diorama, vignette material. And I think I'm gonna give it a shot. Like, what's possible to do with two interesting reference photos, a figure, and a spare metal shell? So let's go and give it a shot, shall we? Okay, so because we only have two little anime protagonists in this project, I'll use this opportunity to give you some more insight into the basic construction techniques that were used here. By the way, I absolutely love the expression on this figure. It's so on point and so over the top. Love it! <laughs> but anyway, not all resin figures are created equal, and that's why working with Panzer art figures is an absolute delight. Not only are their 3D sculpts excellent, but their quality and fit are next to none. Casting blocks are small and easy to remove with side cutters, and the only visible flaws are the small casting seam lines that have to be carefully scraped with a sharp hobby blade. You can sometimes find bubbles in the resin, but these can be filled with super glue or green stuff buddy. As I said, the fit is excellent, which is not always the case with other brands, and yeah, it's just a great modeling experience overall. I usually like to have zero gaps on my figures, even if they're barely noticeable, and for this I like to use thin black super glue that nicely flows where it needs to. Because it dries pretty slowly, it's easy to remove the excess with super glue debonder from VMS, and you can get this potion from mishtai.com at a 15% discount if you're a registered user and use the promo code MOKFRIENDS2023. Pinning is also an important step, as it not only helps with secure placement of the figure in the diorama, but also makes painting much easier, and for this I use 1mm thick copper wires. So that's our figure ready for painting, and again, Panzer Art is definitely my favorite brand, and they're so much fun to paint. Now for the shell. I wasn't sure which one I'd use at first, because the historical photos show both types, the heavy and light one, but ultimately I went with the heavier one because it just shows the sheer size of this monstrosity, and it also has more details to work with. Unfortunately, these shells are still missing some details compared to the real ones, such as grooves that were used to spin the shell, but I wanted to use them anyway because they are metal and that makes them feel more premium, even if the detail is a bit lacking. And yes, as you might have guessed, I'm not trying to replicate any of these photos precisely, I'm just using them for inspiration. So yeah, this process was kinda self-explanatory and we have the most important elements of the scene ready. These are gonna tell the story in the diorama and now we can create the stage around them. Luckily, when you have a good idea and a few blocks of styrofoam, 
You can create an entire diorama with your own hands without buying any commercially available sets. Also, being able to make your own tailor-made base for the scene is a huge advantage. And for this project, I went with a 7 by 7 by 7 cm square. Of course, you can build dioramas from so many materials and use whatever tools that might work for you, but for my experience, owning a styrofoam cutter is one of the biggest game changers as it opens up so many possibilities for you. Besides, you always get a better idea when you can place your props onto the actual base and you can always make it even smaller or cut another one that's a bit larger. Speaking of props, the basement walls gave me a lot of trouble, because it was the first time I'm composing a scene in such a claustrophobic environment. Long story short, I didn't want to build a shadow box diorama, but I didn't want it to look like an open area with some random wall in the background either. So after a few hours of testing and pondering, I decided to roll with the idea that seemed the most efficient to me and just stick with it. But how do you decide when you've done enough thinking? Well, easy. You put the random foam blocks aside and start detailing those that you've already cut to your desired shape. So the bottom line is, when in doubt, start carving bricks. Because <laughs> let's face it, they'll give you plenty of time to think about anything you feel like thinking about. It's not a fast process at all, and you gotta pay attention while you're scribing the initial brick lines, because mistakes are hard to fix. But hey, once the boring carving gets out of the way, fun times begin because this next stage can be considered sculpting. Basically, the point is to enlarge the gaps between each brick. Horizontal lines are easy and fast, and vertical ones are best done with a sharp toothpick. I always make sure to make the edges a bit rounded, although it doesn't look very authentic and it's quite frankly over the top, but it enhances the overall look of the wall, especially when it's painted. And also, all the bricks were never perfect, so it kinda adds to the authenticity as well. I guess it's just my effort to make the result look as intricate as possible, and that's why I also like to push some of the bricks inward under different angles. Yes, sloppy craftsmanship happens in real life and definitely in World War II, and it just allows you to have as much fun with the process as possible. The main point is to make it as three-dimensional as possible, so people won't even believe it's actually just a single block of foam. Okay, now I'm starting to form a better idea about the entire scene, but there was one problem with the back. Should I add details from the other side as well, although it serves no purpose and adds nothing to the story? It goes completely against my minimalistic, focused approach, so ultimately I decided to block it in with foam, then cut it flush with the scene, and while doing so I also cut the protruding brick walls so they would perfectly line up with the base. So the stage is set, and yes, I had to cut the base in two parts, otherwise it wouldn't fit into my foam cutter. But now, I can finally focus all of my attention on detailing and having real fun. Concrete blocks are visible in the reference photo, and they'll add a lot of visual interest to the scene. It's actually very easy to make styrofoam concrete. You just have to stipulate with an old toothbrush and add more texture using putty, which I'm gonna do in a moment. I also wanted to add some basic shapes to the groundwork as well, and here I decided to add a portion of a collapsed wall in the foreground, to make the scene look like a hallway. And to emphasize that feeling, I also made a section of broken ceiling, or ground floor, considering it's taking place in a basement. My favorite material for broken concrete is cork, but here I wanted to keep things consistent, so I ultimately opted for styrofoam. It comes with its own challenges, but it's actually very easy to achieve convincing results. Considering this was my first attempt at this, I was more than pleased with the outcome. So now I'm getting back to texturing, and this time using acrylic putty. This one is your ordinary wood filler bought in a paint store, and guess what, the color doesn't matter either. 
what matters the most is achieving nice texture and that can be effectively done if you let it sit for a couple of minutes and then you even out the surface with a piece of plastic art or something similar. What's even better, you can let this layer fully dry and apply another if you want more intricacy. It might not look like much right now, but you'll see what a creative playground it will be once it comes to painting. So now I could glue the ceiling in place and this will not only frame the entire composition, but also reinforce and line up this clunky, fragile section above the door opening. I quickly added a piece of the broken wall in the foreground and also a bunch of broken concrete pieces on the ground. All of this so I could proceed with the next very important steps. First of all, sculpting the basic shape of the ground with VMS Smart Butt. I'll never stop praising this thing because it's one of the biggest game changers for me. No more air drying clay or thick concoctions from dirt, sand and glue. It's always ready, dry super fast and it's very soft and fluffy. However, this step leads to the next one, giving those ugly foam sides a clean, professional look with wooden veneer. I always start by outlining a basic shape of the ground so I can make a rough cut with scissors. Then I slap some double sided tape on the inner side. This is such a quick and effective way, definitely better and more reliable than using PVA glue which takes ages to dry and often warps the 0.6mm thin wood. Once I have all the sides covered with the veneer, I use a sharp blade to make the final, delicate cut along all the terrain features. This step, it isn't fun, but it's worth putting some effort into it as it greatly improves the overall presentation of the scene. A little bit of sanding with a sponge and we're ready to blend everything together. Lightweight acrylic foam putty is another piece of magic and it can be used for so many things. Here I'm using it to gently blend the concrete slabs with the veneer, completely covering the visible gap between them. Smart Mud was once again used on the lower portions. And note how I left a bit of protruding veneer here and there. That's because additional layers of clay elevate the groundwork upward a little. Basically, the first layer was just a rough outline and now I'm sculpting the final shape of the terrain. So here we have it and it's already looking pretty presentable. All that's left now is to add more texture and some details to make the scene more authentic and interesting. This step involves a lot of trademark products that are hard to obtain, but just bear with me. The first layer was made with real earth from my garden trademark, and take note of those large chunks of earth. These will become pieces of debris once I paint everything in appropriate colors. To fix it in place, I soaked everything with alcohol, which nicely saturates the ground and breaks its surface tension. Dripping diluted PVA glue on top of that is a piece of cake and it will nicely get absorbed into the wet surface. Next layer, plaster bricks from unknown source, trademark. I don't remember where I got these and I had them in my closet for maybe a decade until I started making dioramas. But they're super useful, much, much better than individual foam bricks or 3D printed ones because they can be broken just like real ones and they're nicely imperfect. And the final layer, real rubble from my girlfriend, trademark. <laughs> it's good to know someone who's also doing some house remodeling and using real pieces of plastered walls and broken cinder block adds to the authenticity of the scene. Although, again, the color isn't important because I'm going to adjust everything to my liking with acrylic paints. And just as before, soaking it with alcohol and diluted PVA glue will permanently fix it in place. A few details were missing that needed to be scratch built. This metal door frame was glued from strips of evergreen styrene and gently textured with Tamiya putty diluted in modeling cement. Even plastic has to be glued to the styrofoam with PVA glue, but luckily it creates a pretty strong bond. And finally, I made some rebar by twisting 0.3mm copper wire in an AC drill. Look, I'm no construction historian and it doesn't show in the reference photos, but I'm pretty sure reinforced concrete was a thing in World War II. And besides, it's just a small detail, but it adds so much to the overall look, doesn't it? So there we have it, my friends. This vignette has everything it needed and it's ready for painting. 
I'll have to paint everything as a single piece except the figure and this will complicate a few things, but the composition just didn't allow me to keep the scene in smaller sub-assemblies. Anyway, it's prime time for airbrushing, and by that I mean priming. <laughs> See what I did there? I didn't want any nasty surprises here, so I started by spraying the shell with metal primer. Then everything was covered in a nice opaque layer of black Mr. Surfacer. Metal primer creates a very durable and flexible surface, it pretty much makes metal behave like plastic and paints will hold much better on such a surface. The black primer nicely unifies every material, gives the scene a tidier look and most importantly allows us to post shade the life out of every corner. And there are a lot of shadowed corners in this one. Lacquer thinners can damage styrofoam, but if you apply them through an airbrush, the amount of thinner isn't enough to cause any harm. And, of course, the figure received this treatment as well, as it's a fundamental part of my figure painting process. Let's now paint the scene piece by piece. This is the central piece of the vignette, and also the easiest to finish, so it was a good starting point. German explosive ordnance was painted in olive green or field grey, and I went with the former to make it more vibrant. Of course, I gave it my signature post-shading treatment to bring out its rounded shape, emphasize those few details that are there, and make it overall more visually interesting. I found a few photos where you can see some kind of stencil on the shell, and this caught my eye so much that I wanted to add this little detail. Sadly, I don't have anything remotely accurate in my spares, and I have no idea what could be written on those shells, so I hope you'll forgive me for using whatever I could find. A stencil from a Volkswagen Beetle and some technical specs from an M4 Sherman. <laughs> I still feel like a sinner for doing this, but it just adds so much detail, right? And that's one thing I notice when working on small projects, you become more focused and try to put more effort even into the smallest details. This is also the only part of the scene where I used enamel paints. Everything else is made of or surrounded with styrofoam and that stuff disintegrates the moment it smells mineral spirits. But I kept these special effects to a minimum. Just a quick pin wash and a lot of chipping using dark rust from Vallejo. This is clearly visible in one of the photos, and it makes sense as the shell had to crash through several floors of the Adria building in Warsaw until it stopped in its basement. It was also pointed out on my Patreon that the real shells didn't have their ballistic caps anymore, and honestly, I didn't even know that ballistic caps existed, but even then, there was nothing I could do if I wanted to use the original metal shell from the kit. It's a bummer because the exposed shell looks more interesting, but this whole project was about making compromises. So, okay, that's the shell and it was a nice warm up. Let's now paint the brick walls. Here I employed a collection of methods that I've been using in several of my recent dioramas. It's interesting how when you start doing something new, you tend to experiment with different approaches, changing things up all the time, finding stuff that works best for you, until you make a selection of paints, materials and methods that are absolutely perfect for your style and the look you're trying to achieve. And once you find that, you'll just stick with it. Or at least for a while, because why change things up when you found something that gives the results you desire, right? For me, it's spraying the walls with a mixture of Tami acrylics as a base coat, and then, instead of painting them individually in different tones, I hit them right away with the lightweight foam putty, the same one I used to blend the concrete. I tried wet plaster in the past, also dry plaster mixed with fine sand, and... I mean, the results were good, but the process was always messy, it took a lot of time to dry, and it lacked the random broken texture I always wanted. This putty ticks all my boxes, and I absolutely love working with it. I also like how it leaves a faint white patina on the bricks, giving them a more natural look, even though we just barely started the painting. Note how I use a pretty limited color palette for weathering, and the process can be broken down into three layers. 
The first one consists of pale earth tones, namely light mud, thick tan and in some rare cases pure white if I want to enhance the brick lines or add more patina. These can be applied very generously as long as they're diluted and they give the wall a dusty, faded appearance. At the same time, they make it lighter and introduce more tonal variety into the individual bricks. The second layer consists of dark tones, namely burnt umber and black brown. These have to be applied more sparingly, otherwise they darken the surface beyond repair and I use them for a few specific purposes. To increase contrast in those brick lines with broken and missing mortar, to tone down the mortar in some places, to add fake shadows, for example under the concrete block and in the corners, then to make a few random bricks darker and to simulate grime and streaks of moisture. I also used them to emphasize that huge crack that I sculpted in the wall. When a brick wall cracks, it creates a large, irregular gap between bricks, so I wanted to make that clearly visible. And finally, the third layer is just orange-brown, selectively painted over some bricks to add more vibrancy to the wall. Check out how I outlined the upper edge of the crack with this color, making it more obvious. It's the infinite creativity that makes painting brick walls so enjoyable for me. And here's the result. The coolest part, it's all done with acrylics and it only takes a fraction of the time compared to the sculpting stage. And I know, it looks very dilapidated, but that's how I love my brick walls. I just can't help myself. This was the second most intimidating part for me, because so far I only painted cracked concrete once, and that one was made from cork, so I could slap as many enamel washes over it as I pleased. Here I was limited to acrylics, and I'm not as comfortable with them, but to my surprise, the techniques were almost the same, and the application also felt kinda similar to enamels. You might notice something familiar here, though. The first layers are the same paints I used on the brick wall. Light mud, burnt umber and black brown. It goes to show two things. You can use the same paints for weathering, but the results will be completely different if the base coat is different. The brick wall was sprayed with orange tones, while the concrete was with deck tan. And second, if you use similar or the same colors, the result will be more tied together, more balanced, more visually compact. You get the gist of it, right? But that's where the similarities end. Now I'm gonna use medium grey from AK and pure white from Vallejo to bring out the random shapes and textures in the concrete. The dark washes were used to give it a dirty appearance, but also to outline that texture. Do you see how it works like a system? The dark paints create an outline and put fake shadows around it, and the light paints highlight those raised portions. I told you the textured concrete is gonna be a total withering playground. Another fun fact, concrete is never really grey. All of the paints used here are warm colors, even medium grey from AK has a warm sandy hue. The only cold tone here is pure white, and of course if you want the concrete to look extra crispy, a bit of cheating with a fine brush is always allowed. Some of this texture can be easily outlined with black brown, but I always find it more controllable to paint fake cracks rather than trying to scribe them into the surface with a hobby blade. Oh, and check this out, I used the same approach on the ground floor. The exact same methods, just different textures and it's more exposed to sunlight, so I kept the overall colors lighter. And now for the most intimidating part. Okay, but why is the groundwork the most intimidating? Well, because I can't paint it with enamels, and that's the only way I know. But at this point, I wasn't even afraid. I already changed my mindset and looked at every part of this scene as a learning experience and a departure from my safe bubble. So I changed my approach from the get-go. I usually post shade the ground with buff from Tamiya and then darken it with enamels, but here I started with flat earth, a much darker color, gently sprayed over the black primer. Yes, I gave it some post shading with buff, but mostly on the raised portions and around the rubble where lighter tones could be expected. 
And I also added some orange shades around fallen bricks, as an attempt to visually tie them to the ground. Now it was just about trying to emulate the same experience I normally have with enamels, but with watered down acrylics. I was afraid the surface tension would give me a hard time, but it actually wasn't bad at all. It's just about flooding the surface with a few earth tones and blending them together while they're still wet, namely light mud, raw umber and, you guessed it, black brown. Again, visual consistency. These washes will break that smooth, unnatural airbrush look and also add some contrast and definition. That's actually all I had to do with them, as the majority of the overall effect was achieved by painting the individual chunks in various colors. Some were earthy browns, others orange to simulate broken pieces of bricks, and another large portion was painted with neutral grey and white. This is the point where a lot of people would say, well, why don't you just use a real rubble and yeah, I get it, but you can paint those rocks and chunks of earth in any way you want and it gives you one of the most important things, visual consistency. Everything in this scene is gonna have the same style and that, well at least for me, is the most important aspect of a nice diorama along with a good composition. And that style can be anything photorealistic or stylistic, cartoony, whatever, just make it consistent across the entire board. That's the most important thing. So there we have it, a little bit of dry brushing with light mud finished the job and I was pleasantly surprised with the result, even the process itself considering I never tried acrylics for this job. These are just the cherry on top of this ruined cake and they're also a lot of fun. I have some limited experience with painting rusty surfaces using acrylics and the process is actually very similar to enamels. A good base coat with dark rust is a must on all surfaces. And if it's a small detail such as these rebars, a heavy wash with orange brown is all that you need. But there's always some leftover concrete in those grooves, so I added another wash with neutral grey. The door frame is a much larger surface so it needed more visual texture. I added a few random patches of dark grey under the light rusty wash and then added remnants of old paint. I didn't feel like spraying chipping fluid and a top layer of paint over such a small detail, so it was a nice opportunity to practice some brush painting. I applied it in two layers. The darker one was deck tan and the top one was pure white so it would have a more three-dimensional look. And because this was the last detail, I quickly brushed the wooden sides with a generous coat of Tamiya Flat Black for a clean look that won't draw attention away from the scene. All that's left now is the figure. Remember how I sprayed this chap with black primer as well? That's because I always start my figures with pre-shading from above using deck tan. It's a more subtle color than white and it leads to more natural results. I added fewer highlights on his back considering it's gonna be shadowed by the broken ceiling, but that's the basis of this entire technique. Now I'm gonna paint him with colored glazes and these have to be heavily diluted. I have a very detailed video about this process so check it out if you wanna know every detail, but I'm actually gonna give you more insight than usual in this video as well. What I was happy to find out, the black and deck tan appreciating works exceptionally well with a black uniform. However, I didn't use pure black as the actual top color, instead I opted for dark grey on his pants and generous grey or however I'm supposed to pronounce it on his uniform to give the figure at least some color variety. Two to three glazes are usually enough to get a good coverage. Anything beyond that might be risky as you'd start losing contrast. But it's best to decide for yourself because it depends on the type of paint and how diluted it is. The next step in this approach is outlining every surface detail. Most of the time I use black brown because it works pretty much with any color, but here I went with pure black. I also used this paint to emphasize the shadows, but I had to dilute it slightly more because this effect has to be more subtle than the outlining. Adding some drying retarder into the mixture helps with smooth color transitions and luckily, if you make a mistake, it's usually very easy to fix it with highlights. I usually find shadows to be more time consuming than lights anyway, so the process kinda balances itself out. 
Highlights were mixed from the base color and a generous amount of Iraqi sand. You should never make grays or blacks lighter with white, because it will lead to a very unnatural, frosted appearance. Use warm colors instead, it'll give it a comforting, cloth-like feeling. One strong highlight is usually enough to give the shading more pop and definition, and that's what makes this process very easy and straightforward. Finally, I bring out the details with an even lighter color, but it also has to be more opaque, so it doesn't accidentally spill somewhere it shouldn't. And also, buttons in a nice shiny color always contrast nicely with the dark uniform. As I mentioned, I used a different color on his jacket, and this one has a darker and more purple hue. The upper clothing items are always more difficult to paint, or at least for me, because pants are simple, right? Just two straight trunks with some nice folds, and that's basically it. More time and care has to be taken here, especially with shadows and outlines, but highlights are usually just as quick as anywhere else. Shoulders are the only difficult part, as here you often have a large, smooth surface that requires a subtle color gradient. Once again, shiny details make it look crispy, and the pink tanker insignia also adds a nice splash of color. So that's the Panzer Crew uniform painted using the glazing method. Pretty fast and very satisfying. Smaller details are easier to post shade from the ground up, and that calls for a very dark base coat, usually black-brown. On most figures I paint, these details are often made from leather, and I have created my own reliable system for this type of surface as well. I started with dark rust which covers most of the surface except the deepest faults and seam lines, and then I keep making it lighter with orange-brown, painting smaller and smaller areas with each layer. I usually mix two highlights in this manner and finish it off with pure orange-brown for the most extreme highlights. If I want to add some scratches or wear or make the small seam line stand out, I add Iraqi sand into the orange paint. And if I want a dirty, sort of greasy leather or worn black leather, I give it a few glazes with diluted dark grey. And I actually started painting skin tones using the glazing method as well. Although it's not as effective here, because it's always a very small area that needs a ton of contrast, so most of the heavy lifting has to be done with carefully applied shadows and lights. But this can be also turned into a streamlined process. I start by emphasizing the shadows and outlining details such as the mouth, ears, nose and so on. Very diluted cavalry brown is my main shadow color, and it also gives the skin some vibrancy. Burnt Umber is only for the deepest and darkest shadows, usually below the chin and as an outline for the hair and mouth. Then it's just about highlighting the facial features with basic skin tone and flat flesh, although I always try not to overdo them, because the shadows give the face a more dramatic look. But all of this would be nothing without some vibrant glazes. Flat red on the cheeks, lower lip and earlobes, and Prussian blue for some facial hair or just to emphasize the shadows on the neck. For hair, I start with burnt umber and make it lighter with Iraqi sand. You can end up with graying hair or try to make a dirty blonde using this method. And finally, weathering. I stopped trying and failing to make smooth transitions here and instead decided to embrace the texture. So it's basically just stippling with very diluted earth colors to make the figure more integrated with the scenery. And that's pretty much it, my very simplified process of painting figures. I was never a very ambitious figure painter to begin with, so yeah, take that for what it is. Now I can super glue him to the base and this is where the metal pins come in handy for the second time, because now there's absolutely no chance he would randomly fall off at some point. I was worried his dark uniform would make him sort of vanish into the background, but actually, I think he stands out very nicely. What do you think? Or actually, let me know what you think about the whole scene down in the comments, please. 
This is something I've never done before and a couple of years ago I would never even imagine doing a vignette revolving around a single figure. I started this channel as an armor modeler and tanks were always my main focus. Detailing them and making most out of their weathering was my bread and butter. Later I tried creating a simple piece of terrain for one of my models and then you convinced me to try adding and painting some stowage and learning the shading techniques there gave me the confidence to try painting my first figure. Once the ice was broken, I felt confident enough to start experimenting with my first real dioramas, but the main focus was always the tank. The buildings and terrain features were just a backdrop and figures were just an addition that told a simple story. So you can now probably imagine how different and refreshing it was to build a scene that's just about one figure and a large unexploded shell of course, but you see the difference. And it feels extra satisfying to me when I look back into my past and how I avoided figures or landscapes. But it's actually not just that, it's also the fact that this vignette was a completely spontaneous idea fueled by inspiration and creativity. I mean, if I didn't have those unused metal shells and a leftover figure that has the best possible pose for this scene, the vignette wouldn't even exist and I'd be probably building another tank. So yeah, even though this vignette is less than 7x7 7 7 centimeters in size, it makes me more happy and proud than some of my largest and most ambitious dioramas. So what do you think? Would you like to see more of these in the future? That's actually what I was hinting at in the previous video, how an unused part from a model can give you so much freedom and creativity if you have a good idea in your mind. Anyway, I'm gonna start another project and it's again gonna be something completely different and something we haven't done on this channel yet. But it's also gonna be kinda similar to this scene in a few aspects. Until then, I'd like to say thank you for watching, my friends, and a special thanks goes to my wonderful patrons who make this show possible because I can do this thing as my full-time job. If you like what I'm doing, want to get more of it, and in return support my work, you can go to my Patreon page and see what kind of reward would you like. I'm posting there almost every day with updates from my workbench, we can get in touch through DMs, comments and emails, I'm posting one week early ad-free videos, I also have some small 3D models for detailing your projects, a bunch of references from the real world if you need inspiration for, let's say, old buildings, landscapes and so on, and of course, these beautiful studio photos which you can download in full resolution. Alright, dear friends, what's left to say at the end? This is probably the longest video I've ever done so far, and ironically it's about one of my smallest creations. The next one is gonna be slightly bigger for sure, but it's not gonna be a tank. Not yet. <laughs> I'm not gonna spoil anything, but um... Machine and Krieger? <laughs> okay, I spilled my beans, so you do me a favor, okay? Stay safe, stay awesome, build your models, don't just collect them, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers!